would you give us some idea in your own words of after you're in there for four or five or six weeks, how do you feel as a human being? You feel completely degraded, um, very, very sort of terrified that um, you may have to go through another one of these confessions or um, maybe that you would get beaten up or, you know, you're also, because you haven't been sleeping, um, you're in a horrific mental state. And you were a 40-something-year-old woman with a very, very respected job. Yes. Former Scientology executive Debbie Cook was the first to give sworn testimony about a place known as The Hole. But other church defectors, speaking with the Tampa Bay Times, have expanded on her account, offering the fullest picture yet of the troubling events that occurred there. The defectors also were interviewed by FBI agents, who focused on the hole as they investigated the church's working conditions. The hole was a building made of several double-wide mobile homes on the west side of Scientology's 500-acre compound, 80 miles east of Los Angeles. Constructed in the late 1990s, it served for years as office space for Scientology's international management team. Then, around 2004, according to defectors, it became a place of punishment as Scientology leader David Miscavige grew increasingly unhappy with the performance of the church's top officers. The leader ordered them to own up to their failings in group confessions, the defectors say. All were members of Scientology's religious order, the Sea Org. At first, about 40 men and women occupied the whole. Later, the number grew to a hundred, as Miscavige deemed more and more officers to be underperforming. Scientology's former spokesperson, Mike Rinder, says he was there from the start. This practice of group confessions grew up in the whole, and it was some thing where Miscavige has ha developed this idea that you had to confess to your peers all of your horrible transgressions and that they were supposed to extract out of you these transgressions, particularly related to your trans theoretical transgressions against Miscavige himself. Like, what have you done to COB? What have you done to try and hurt COB? What have you done here? What have you, I mean, this is like the mantra of the whole. This would be carried out by whoever happened to be there, 20 people, 30 people, 50 people, all standing up there and screaming at you about, oh, tell us why. And eventually, you know, it, it sort of devolved into ultimately physical violence and torture to extricate these, quote, confessions out of people. John Brousseau had been a member of the Sea Org since 1978. He worked for years at the desert compound, fixing vehicles, working on electronics and construction projects, a jack of all trades. He also became a trusted aide to Miscavige. Brousseau said the leader made it apparent why he sent so many church staffers to the hole. I mean, we're talking constantly berating them, nitpicking everything they're doing, pointing up inadequacies, ineffectiveness, lack of results, blaming it all on them and their, and their inability to, to do anything right, and on the other hand saying how he's got to do everything himself, he's the only one that can do things right. Defectors say it was 2006 when conditions in the hole worsened. Brousseau said he received an urgent call from Miscavige's secretary, Elan Baram. He called me down to what was called the CMO Int Trailers. So I went down there and I met him and he said to me, COB wants this place made secure. He's worried that some of these people might blow. He wants you to put steel bars on all the doors except these. Brousseau suggested that screwing the doors closed might be more secure. He said, no, COB said, put steel bars on. You're not going to alter it. Put steel bars on. I said, OK, I'll put steel bars on. So I went down to the garage and uh, 
went into an area that was a stockpile of building materials that I was very familiar with, and I found some real heavy uh, tubular steel. It was chrome-plated, so I went over to the engineering department with this stuff, and I cut pieces to the exact right length I needed to span these doors. I went to a drill press, and I drilled two holes in each end, and I grabbed some really strong steel screws, and I grabbed my cordless screw gun, and I drove up there, and I went to the first door, and I put the bar on, and I shot two screws in the left, two screws in the right. The next door, same thing. All the doors, except for the doors that were designated as the only entry and exit. Brousseau said he also drove special screws in all the windows to ensure they opened only about four inches. He said he noticed a few weeks later that someone else had removed the bars. But several other restrictions kept the executive team confined, and the group confessions became more intense. The church said in a statement, Any allegations of bars being installed to hold people against their will is false and malicious and is denied. It said Brousseau and Rinder are disgruntled ex-members who are making false allegations. The church also said that, much like other religious orders, the Sea Org practices ecclesiastical discipline, and no laws are ever broken in the process. According to Rinder, Miscavige sometimes dictated what he wanted people to confess in the whole. Other times, the managers pushed one another to confess. The 50 people there all screaming at me and telling me that I've done this and I've done that. Why don't I just admit it and I stole money and I had affairs and all. I mean, all, people just literally, Tom, randomly dream up bullshit and start screaming it out. And then the mob starts going crazy like, oh, yeah, it must have been that. Oh, yeah, it must have been that. There's all sorts of written confessions that people have done and they, they read like, North Korean POW write-ups. The hole now had a security guard at the door around the clock, according to Rinder and other defectors. Meals were brought in from the mess hall because the executives were not allowed to eat with the rest of the staff. Everyone in the building spent nights in sleeping bags or on cots, staking out floor space in offices and conference rooms. I never really saw much when I went in there other than I went in there and you could sort of smell the smell. People live here. People sleep here. I think I went in there very early one morning and people were very sleepy-eyed, like they had just gotten up. And if you ever lived in a dormitory in college or something and, you know, you come home late and everybody's snoring, it stinks. Occasionally, some were allowed out of the hole to appear at church events or to perform other duties. But as time went on, some occupants had spent months or years in the hole. Rinder said it was taking a toll. By late 2006, this had degenerated from not just screaming at people to get them to, quote, confess to whatever bizarre stuff someone had thought up that they had done, but this is the, the beginning of the trash cans, putting people to stand in... Um, big trash cans, putting signs around people's necks with various things, you know, I'm an SP, I'm, I'm CI, whatever, to actual physical torture of people who were theoretically not cooperating. I mean, on many occasions, people were slapped, punched, kicked, pushed, shoved, thrown up against the wall. Um, that was relatively routine behavior in the hole by that time. Brousseau often saw the occupants of the hole as security guards marched them two abreast to a nearby maintenance garage to take showers. They looked like they knew they were being marched to the gallows. They, they just looked lifeless with no purpose. Hung, you know, very hangdog, droopy shoulders, slouchy, you know, very sad, inward looking features, you know, it was, it, was, it was not pleasant to look upon them. Mike Rinder said managers demanding confessions would order people to crawl laps around a conference table. They told them to roll up their pant legs so their knees scraped against the rough indoor-outdoor carpeting. If you do this for some days on end, you end up with, with fairly severe 
um, contusions and abrasions. And this sort of, of actual physical torture, it kind of devolved and degenerated into that to try and get people to come up with confessions that were acceptable. Because as time went on, what was being confessed to was mild or it wasn't it, it had to keep getting more and more dramatic and more and more over the top in order to be acceptable. Rinder described a time when church executive Russ Bellin was trying to get another executive, Kurt Weiland, to confess to a long ago failing in a legal case against the church. Rinder said Weiland was made to sit under an air vent with the cooling system turned on high. He said Bellin poured water over Weiland's head to induce a confession. This went on for, I don't know, maybe an hour. And by the end of an hour, he was shaking so uncontrollably and his lips were completely blue and he was incapable of talking. And he was being told he had to confess and he couldn't talk. What did you do at that moment? I watched like a good minion. Why didn't you intervene? I didn't want the same thing happening to me. Do you regret that? Of course. Of course. I regret a lot of things about those experiences and things that I did to other people and things that I watched or participated in. And it's partly what motivates me to speak now. Wyland supplied the Times with a sworn statement saying the water incident with Bellin never happened. Church officials declined to be interviewed. They responded with a general statement and did not answer detailed written questions about the hole. A church lawyer told ABC News that the hole does not exist and never has. Debbie Cook said Miscavige himself showed her the hole after he summoned her from Clearwater to work at the California compound in 2005. She told her story in court after the church sued her for violating the confidentiality agreement she signed when she left the staff in October 2007. Cook took the stand in a Texas courtroom on February 9, 2012. Uh, Mr. Miscavige briefed me about it and explained um, that, uh, that he had put about 40 executives of Scientology International into basically locked up into a room called The Hole. And he took me there um, personally and showed me. In May 2007, after leading the church's Clearwater operations for 17 years and filling in at the California base, Cook herself fell out of favor with Miscavige. I was on the phone to him. Uh, I was in an office. Um, the, someone was pounding on the door. Because I was on the phone to him, I didn't answer. I was trying to be on the phone and, and uh, talk to him. And uh, and then after uh, some the beating stopped, and then um, uh, someone pried the window open of the office that I was in, and two big guys came in through the window. And um, Mr. Miscavige said to me on the phone, are they there? And I said, yes, they are. And he said, goodbye. And two men physically took me uh, away to, to this trailer area, which is called the hole. It had bars on the windows, and the one entrance was guarded by security 24 hours a day. Um, and it contained in it, at the time that I went into the hole in May of 2007, there was over 100 top um, Scientology International executives that had been put there. You ate there, you slept there on the floor, um, and you, know, you never left with the exception of a brief period to go take a shower and come back. What would y'all do all day long? You're 24 hours a day in the hole. What would go on? Did it have a, a routine or? There was no routine. Um, it sort of depended on different things. But most of what was going on were these um, bizarre confessions that are um, 
I would really like to state that they are not any kind of standard Scientology practice. The church says Cook's courtroom statements are entirely false. Cook told the Times, I take very seriously being under oath, and I absolutely told the truth. Were there any other forms of discipline other than the confession? There was you know, a couple of very violent times where um, people were, um, a, a couple guys were uh, physically beaten up by many other men in the, in the hole. What did you being eat? De being demanded to, to confess to something that they didn't, really didn't do, and so then it would drag out for hours, and they were being beaten and demanded to confess. Confess what? I, I'm not. Well, in that particular example, um, it was Guillaume Lazur, who was the executive director international, and Mark Yeager, who was the commanding officer of the top, um, of, of really the watchdog committee. And, um, and it was demanded that they confess to being homosexuals and having homosexual activity between the two of them. And then they were beaten? Yes, they were beaten. Cook said the group turned on her when she spoke up for Lesev and Jaeger. She said she was made to stand in a trash can for 12 hours as her church colleagues poured water over her head and body. She said they were trying to get her to confess to being a lesbian. Why didn't you just take off and get away from the hole? It's not possible. Absolutely not physically possible. We couldn't make it past security. The, the, the windows were barred. Um, right from the beginning when I went in, I, I obviously was trying to figure out, plotting how to how to get out. And, but anyway, it's not, not possible. In February 2007, just three months before Cook arrived in the hole, Rinder was pulled out and sent to London to deal with a story by the BBC. Still gaunt from his time in the hole, Rinder ran away from the Sea Org and returned to the U.S. He did not alert authorities to conditions in the hole, fearing it would damage the church. Then, beginning in 2009, many defectors, including Rinder, spoke to human trafficking investigators for the FBI. The agents spent more than a year examining conditions at Scientology's California compound, including the hole. According to former church members who were FBI witnesses, the investigation lost its momentum in late 2010. Scientology officials questioned whether there ever was an FBI investigation. However, the Times interviewed numerous former church members who said they spoke with agents for hours. Some produced emails and text messages they had shared with the agents. By 2010, according to Brousseau, the church officers who had been in the hole for years were allowed to sleep in regular rooms and eat in the mess hall, but they were still reporting to the hole daily. In March of that year, after 33 years in the church, Brousseau came to a realization that changed his life. I remembered Guillaume Lesseff when he was such a dynamic, upbeat, vibrant person. And I remembered Heber Gentsch. And I remembered, you know, just dozens of these people. They were just so alive. And I looked at them now, they were just these husks. You know, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't say or originate anything. They, they, they seemed to have no purpose. You know, they just kind of were like sheep. And I went, there's no way. There's no way that a hundred people can all be evil, horrid SPs and DM's the only one. No way. I, I can't stand seeing this happen to, you know, some of these people I've known for decades. They used to be great friends of mine, and now I can't hardly talk to them, you know? It's like they have no life. I can't stop it from within, but I at least can stop supporting it. So I left. Reporting with Joe Childs and Maurice Rivenbark, this is Tom Tobin for the Tampa Bay Times.